We're here at the historic Lang Place in Crawfordsville, Indiana on March the 30th, 1992. It's a rather overcast day and uh, we're getting a little bit of mist, but it is a beautiful day here in Crawfordsville. This morning we are going to tape another interview uh, with a veteran of World War II. Uh, this will be another interview and a series of interviews that we've been doing with veterans of World War II. If my mathematics are right, we have some 30 other tapes of interviews that are now in our library. Uh, this interview this morning uh, is with a local person, and I think you'll be very interested in what we have to say. The idea for these interviews uh, started back with Gene Burns, uh, who did a documentary on the Civil War. And in this, we saw pictures and interviews with old gentlemen uh, with long beards. And uh, so far in these interviews, we haven't had any gentlemen with long beards, but I think back in those days, uh, people wore long beards. Uh, this uh, idea all started with Bob Wernley, semi-retired attorney, here in Crawfordsville, uh, who got the idea and called me. I'm Claire Chamberlain of the local American Legion and VFW. Our cameraman is Ed Miller from the American Legion and VFW. Uh, we're here, as I said before, at Lane Place, and the executive director here is Mike Hall. Uh, these tapes, uh, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, will be placed in the library. They are property of the Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in this, and this morning's interview will be no exception. And so at this time, could I ask you your full name, please? Louis Eugene Douglas. Uh, where were you born? I was born in Newmarket, Indiana. Oh, you're not very far from home then, this morning. Right. Right. Uh, I'm going to call you Gene. That's the way I know you. Uh, well, I, I know, I'm known as Gene and Doug. Right. And a lot of other names. And a lot of other names. Yes. Well, we're certainly glad to have you here. Uh, who were your parents? My parents were Walter Lewis Walter Douglas and Cora Wright Douglas. I see. Were they local people? Yes. They were born and raised in the New Market area. I see. Where did you go to grade school? I went to grade school. Well, back in those days, and unless you owned your own farm. Uh, farmers moved about every three years, and my father uh, did not own a farm. Uh, after World War I, he had lost his farm during the Depression, and uh, we moved about every three years. And I was, uh, I went to school at Garfield, where I began school, and then I went to uh, Young's Chapel School when Garfield closed and then uh, to Whitesville School. I see. In grade school. Uh, what year were you born, Gene? 19 and 22. January 2nd. January 2nd. You came very close to being a New Year's baby. Yeah, very, very close. Uh, now, you, you mentioned some of the places that you went to grade school. Uh, where did you go to high school? Well, I was zoned to go to Newmarket. But if you remember back in those days, uh, some of the smaller schools did not furnish all of the classwork that you might want. So I left home at 15 and started to school at Crawfordsville because they had uh, classes in, uh, in uh, things that I wanted to take in school, mm -hmm. and uh, which were not furnished at Newmarket. So I came to town to Crawfordsville, got a job, got a room, and uh, was pretty much on my own for the first two years of high school. I see. And then I had uh, sisters that lived here in town. By the way, I, had, I was the youngest of ten children, and I had seven sisters and two brothers. So the last year of school, I lived pretty much with one of my sisters, and uh, uh, money was short, and I uh, found that it was pretty difficult to be in sports and to work on the side and to make it on my own. So uh, one of my sisters permitted me to live with her mm -hmm. through graduation. Did uh, what sports did you play, Gene? 
I was in uh, four years of football and three years of track. Uh, track uh, started the year I was a sophomore in high school. They, they did not have it prior to that. <coughs> what uh, event did you participate in track? I was in uh, the, the uh, dashes, the 100 yard dash, the 220. You could only be in four events in, in most meets. And I was in the uh, uh, relay team and ran the low hurdles. Mm -hmm. That would get you out of high school around 1940, Gene? Graduated in, graduated in 1940. Mm -hmm. Then what did you do? Then I went to work at Donnelly's uh, in December of 1940. I graduated in June and I went to, uh, uh, well, myself and two other boys, local boys. Uh, jobs were hard to find at that time when you got out of high school. There just, there just weren't any. And we put our application in every place and hitchhiked to Milwaukee and put our application in at every factory in every major city between here and Milwaukee. And then we rode a ferry over to Ludington, Michigan. And uh, I worked there in, a, well, all three of us did, in a summer resort until October and the summer resort closed. It was a fishing camp. Uh -huh. And uh, then I, uh, we hitchhiked back to Crawfordsville. And in December, I got a call the same day from two places that I had put an application in. One was Mid-States, Steel and Wire, uh -huh. and the other one was uh, Donnelly's. So I interviewed with both of them and uh, um, wasn't exactly uh, promised a uh, apprenticeship at Donnelly's, but uh, they made it clear that uh, if I was, my work was satisfactory, it would be forthcoming. And uh, Mid-States really paid more money at the time, but uh, I, in knowing uh, people that worked at Mid-States and at Donnelly's, I felt that in the long run, probably Donnelly's was going to pay the, the most money. Uh -huh. And particularly if I could get an apprenticeship, then I could, uh, that, that's a pretty good education it was at that time at Donnelly's. It's almost the, the equivalent, I felt, as, uh, of a college education. You took classes at Wabash, and you took uh, uh, classes at Donnelly's. Uh, Hugo Prince, which many of you will remember, uh, took care of the uh, apprentices at Donnelly's mm -hmm. and uh, had a world of experience himself. And uh, I felt like I got a pretty good education at Donnelly's without going to college. I oh. did. I did want to go to uh, college, and I wanted to go to Wabash. And uh, strangely enough, and uh, I won a athletic scholarship to Wabash through my track records, and uh, a scholastic scholarship to Wabash, which we tested for. And uh, no one explained in in the process that you could only use one of those scholarships at that time. So when I uh, made application to Wabash, I found that I could only use one of the scholarships and neither one of them were really big enough to, uh, to take you through college. Uh -huh. But uh, then I kind of gave up and I figured, well, I'd work at Donnelly's six months to a year and, I would, and then I would drop out and go back to Wabash. But it didn't work out that way and you had responsibilities and those things kind of take care of themselves. Where were you when World War II broke out? Here in Crawfordville, working at Donnelly's. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what procedure followed then that uh, steered you towards the military? Well, uh, of course everyone uh, was either volunteering or they were being drafted. I did not want to be drafted, I wanted to choose the branch of service that I wanted to go in, so I volunteered for uh, with Indianapolis and and uh, signed up for the Marine Corps. What date was this? 1942. 1942. November 42. November 42. Uh, I'm. A, you were accepted, of course. Yes, I was accepted, and I had uh, uh, 
two weeks uh, after I was accepted until I left for California in boot camp. That was at uh, what camp? San then? Diego. In San Diego. Mm -hmm. How long were you in boot camp? Well, I was there eight weeks in boot camp. And then I was in uh, what they call line camp at Camp Elliott, California for about uh, four weeks uh, in preparation to shipping out, shipping overseas. Mm -hmm. So from the time I entered uh, the Marine Corps and within two months, I was, uh, or three months, I was on my way overseas. What, what are some of the things that you did in boot camp? Well, like training for... I would have to say the purpose of boot camp is to really I've thought about this a lot, and uh, they don't explain this fully, but I've thought about it a lot. Uh, the purpose of boot camp is to break you from civilian life. And they almost, uh, they work hard at it, uh, almost getting you to hate everything and everybody. I mean, that seems to be the purpose of boot camp. Mm -hmm. uh, you learn the discipline, and uh, uh, Anyone who's been in the service and gone through boot camp knows that it's kind of a, it's, it's your first living hell is right there in boot camp. I would agree. And they break you from the civilian life. I, I'm sure that is the purpose. And they, they uh, many, many uh, people who go into the service have had very little discipline. And uh, this is your first reaction to discipline. Uh, when you left to Indianapolis and went to California, would I recognize any of the people that I know now that might have joined at the same time you did? No. I did not know. It, it was a troop train um, filled with boys from Pennsylvania and uh, Michigan and Indiana, and there was not another one on the train uh, at the same time I was from Crawfordsville. I was the only one at that particular time. How many days did it take you, approximately? It took us three days to get to California. Was it a pretty rough ride? Well, no. It, uh, uh, it, strangely enough, it was, it was all a new experience, and I met and talked to, to people that you wouldn't otherwise uh, uh, come in association with. For instance, I, I met boys on the train, and we would see cattle uh, in Kansas and some of the western states, and those boys, strangely enough, had never seen a live cow. Isn't that something? And uh, here they were, 18, 19, 20 years old, and they had never seen a live cow. People came from New York, from uh, Philadelphia, from Pennsylvania, and, and they just uh, had no occasion to ever see one. They see pictures, they knew what they were, but they, they had never seen a live one. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was real, <laughs> that was a real strange. You said two months after you got to California, Gene, you were ready to ship out. Did you ship out? Yes. Mm -hmm. Where did you go? I went, uh, we went to Melbourne, Australia, and that's where I joined the 1st uh, Marine Division as a replacement. And uh, they, they had just come off of Guadalcanal, which was our first offensive uh, land action, really, in the Pacific mm -hmm. during World War II. And uh, I joined them there as a replacement and took training with them there. And then uh, our first campaign was uh, New Britain, or Cape Gloucester, as they called it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we established uh, what we called a, a permanent base for training and to get in replacements and uh, on the Russell Islands, on an island called Kavuvu in the Russell Islander. I see. <clears throat> what kind of a ship did you go from the United States to Australia, Gene? We went on what they called a merchant, a merchant ship, and uh, it was not a large ship, mm -hmm. uh, but adequate, and uh, I, I can't tell you how many were on, the, on board the ship at the time. Was it in a convoy? Uh, yes, uh, part way, and then uh, we broke off as we got closer to Australia, and I guess uh, they must have felt that the the ocean was safe in that area. So uh, the convoy left us and dispersed into other areas, but yeah. uh, and we continued on to Australia. Did you have any uh, 
uh, air attacks or submarine attacks by the enemy at all? On uh, going to on, Australia? No, 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 no. You had uh, drills, though. Oh yeah, we had drills. Yeah, that's a that's a just a compulsory part of it, I guess. But uh, no, we were never. Uh, to my knowledge, we were never even under surveillance by plane or by submarine. Yeah. Was the merchant ship armed? Yes. A uh, small gun. I think the largest was uh, an 8 inch. Uh, but there were several of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had uh, an anti aircraft uh, battery. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and they did practice and they fired, but uh, mm -hmm. that was just practice. Right. Okay, then you, uh, from Australia, you set up a camp on what island, Jane? Pavuvu Island in the Russell Island Group. And there's a, well, I don't know really how many islands there are in the Russell Island Group, but uh, it's, a, it's a pretty pretty large complex of islands, and many of them are small. Mm -hmm. And I guess we were on the largest one, which was originally uh, a plantation, a coconut plantation, owned by the English. And uh, when we got there, uh, the Japanese had occupied the island, uh, but had moved out. We didn't have uh, we didn't have to uh, uh, run off that island, Kubu Island, and uh, uh, there was no firefight or anything there. But it was. Uh, Did you have enemy attacks there? No, no, none at all, and. Uh, it was a. It had been as a coconut plantation had not been taken care of in the last few years, um, uh, for some reason, and there were old coconuts uh, and palm leaves uh, piled and rats. You would not believe the number of rats. In fact, they to get rid of the rats, they they pulled a very unique uh, thing. We thought they had. Uh, a contest, and uh, whoever caught the most rats uh, on a certain day, uh, then they gave beer ration to those people, and uh, that was that was our pay. And and you cannot believe some of the ingenious ideas and ways of getting rid of rats. And there would be guys that would catch a hundred uh, to two hundred rats in their traps that they they designed and built out of anything and everything in order to get rid of the rats. That's interesting, dude. really interesting. Well, how long were you on this island? Well, I was on, that was our, became our permanent base, our permanent headquarters for the 1st Marine Division. And uh, uh, a detachment of Seabees, and the Seabees uh, did most of the road work and the trenching because it rained an awfully lot. And uh, they they built most of the roads. Uh, we had a small airport finally built there, but uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't accept uh, fighter planes or anything of that kind, just Piper Cubs. And uh, I guess I was there on the Russell Islands as a permanent base, probably for uh, we left there uh, to go on the campaigns, uh, Peleliu. Uh, island, which we took, and Okinawa. So I guess I was there probably at uh, Kabubu Island, probably a total of, uh, uh, as a permanent base, maybe 18 months. I see. But we went to... Uh, Is that where you made your first invasion from? Yes. Uh -huh. What was your first? The first invasion that we made from there was uh, Peleliu Island. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, Peleliu Island was a, a small island. Uh, but it had an a airport on it, and uh, that's why we decided that, I guess the uh, powers to be decided that we needed to take that airport, was to eliminate the Japanese use of that island for their air support. Mm -hmm. And uh, supposedly, according to our intelligence, we were to take that island in 48 hours. We were to cut the island in two, make our landing and cut the island straight in two, and uh, then secure both ends. And figuring that way we would split the Japanese forces. 
in 48 hours, we were still in the water. When the tide came in, we had never secured enough land to uh, have foxholes and in the dry. We were still in the water when the tide came in. What kind of a vessel did you come up to the island? Then how did you get? Well, we were on we were on troop ships, and uh, the Navy set and for three solid days and nights, and this is in the records. The Navy shelled that island. I mean, with with uh, warships, destroyers, and it was continuous shelling of that island. And if they killed very few of the Japanese, mm -hmm. that island was a. Uh, a coral island and it had natural caves in it and all they did was go back into those caves and it had been the Japanese had used it uh, to mine phosphorus and uh, they had made uh, many of those caves and they reinforced them and they just had a network mm -hmm. through the coral and you could wear out a pair of shoes in three days on the coral rock yeah. I mean, just cut them to pieces. All right, you got up there on a troop ship. All right, take us from the time that the, that the troop ship uh, anchored or, or was stationary. Okay. Then tell us how, what you got into and how you got ashore. Well, the way you get ashore, um, they go in waves. You load onto uh, LST boats, which are the landing boats. And uh, you go down nets or ropes, and so many to a ship, to an LST. And um, I think there was probably 25 or 30 people in each of the LSTs. Then you circle until all of those get loaded. And you just circle in the water. And uh, when they're ready, then, and all of them are loaded, all, of, all the troops are loaded on those, then we headed for shore spread out and headed right straight into the shore. And uh, of course there were several boats doing this. I mean several of the large troop transports. We weren't all on one. And uh, we got hung up on the, on the coral rock and the uh, fencing barbed wire that the Japanese had put into the, to the uh, bay and into the water and some of it was underwater you couldn't even see it we got the LSTs hung up on that and couldn't go all the way in then they had to bring amphibious boats in so that they could get over that coral reef and over the wire and take us on into shore well they had uh, of course the Japanese had tested they knew exactly where the uh, boats were going to get hung up where the wire was and they just lobbed thousands and thousands uh, mortar shells into that area and there we were trying to transfer from uh, LSTs to amphibious vehicles to get all the rest of the way in and many many uh, guys never even got uh, they, they just had to walk in uh, through the water and uh, you drop in holes over your head and, mm -hmm. and hope you could make it. Is that, that the way you got ashore? Yeah, that's the way I got ashore. Did uh, several of your uh, did your uh, landing craft get hit? No, my landing craft didn't get hit, but uh, at least uh, none of us got killed uh, in making the transfer. But boy, they were all around us, and uh, we were just fortunate that our landing craft didn't, or my the one I was on. And uh, uh, we waited probably the last uh, 50 yards to shore, right okay. over the coral rock, and then Water, so like I said, sometimes over your head. Tell us what problems you ran into as you hit the shore. Well, when we hit the shore, uh, our objective was to uh, secure the airport as quickly as possible. And I was in our company and K Company uh, was to take that airport and set up, up a perimeter defense. And. Uh, like I said, the first 48 hours when the tide came in, we were in the water. We hadn't even, you can't say we really, when, when we first uh, got there, we were on dry land. And then when the tide came in, we were in water. 
And that's as far as we could go. And we were hitting all kind of resistance. Uh, like I said, the Navy shelled for three days and nights. And uh, it just absolutely did no good in that coral rock. Mm -hmm. They just backed into the caves and stayed there until the shelling was over and then came out. Was any of this hand-to-hand -hand fighting? Oh, yes. Yes. Quite a bit of it. Mm. Yeah. We were able to, uh, we were finally able to uh, push in far enough. Well, Peleliu Island is six degrees off the equator. And uh, you can imagine uh, how hot that is at six degrees off the equator. Any, any body, Japanese or American, that was killed within three days started deteriorating, decaying, and uh, the smell is absolutely sickening. And we didn't have enough land at the end of three days for burial. And they were burying the, the uh, corpses at sea, anybody that was killed. Just load them on amphibs, tarpaulin over them, taking them out to sea, wait on them. That's, that's the only kind of burial we could get. And sure. that was to keep down the disease and the, the horrible odor of dead bodies. And there were thousands of them. I know. Uh, had you met uh, some close friends and buddies by this time that were by your side as you... Yes, on Peleliu, uh, the one that was at the, uh, at the Silver Star presentation, uh, Earl Dergu, uh, I met him. Uh, he came into Peleliu as her to uh, Pavubu Island as a replacement, mm -hmm. where I joined the outfit in, uh, in uh, Australia. He joined us at Pavubu Island, which became uh, in the Russell mm -hmm. Island group. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we, were, we were in the same tent area together during training and, uh, and left from there to go to Peleliu together. Right. Tell us more now, uh, Gene. Uh, things are really really rough there. Uh, tell us more as the battle progressed there on the island, uh, how you were able to to take the island and more of what happened. Well, our, like I said, our original plan was to, to cut the island in two. And, uh, and we were able to do that. We secured the airport first and uh, that meant that uh, they couldn't bring any airplanes in to land so uh, the airport belonged to us. Then they started immediately, and they worked day and night, the Seabees did, uh, increasing the size of the runways on the airport so that we could bring in B-29s. And uh, when I, I got wounded there and, uh, at Peleliu, and, and when I went back to the airport, uh, you wouldn't have recognized at all as what we as the airport that we took. It did, there was just nothing similar about it. They had increased that thing in so so much that the B-29s were landing on it. And they would come in at night, a lot of times the Japanese would, and bomb the airport runways and the CBs never even quit working. Hmm. They just absolutely didn't quit. They just filled in the hole, put wire mesh over it, and went on. When you were wounded, where where did you go then? Well, when I got wounded on uh, on Peleliu, they put me on board a, a hospital ship, setting out in the bay, and that's where uh, we didn't have enough the land secured really to get uh, uh, a hospital set up. So they put them put us on uh, took us out by. Uh, LSTs to uh, the hospital ship setting in the bay and uh, I had been shot through the leg and uh, that hospital ship was probably setting a half mile out. Uh, I stayed there overnight, they dressed the wound and, uh, and got me where I could walk again and the next day I went over the side and swam back to shore and joined my outfit. I've heard that. I've heard that. Not from you, but I had heard that you did it. That is fantastic. Uh, when I got back, out of 247 men that we had made in, in that landed with our company, that's how many were in the company. Uh, 
there were nine people left. And part of them had been wounded, the same as I had. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's out of the 247 was all of us left. And mm -hmm. K Company, which uh, uh, I, only know, I only know of one local boy that was in the K Company, and he was from Waynetown, named Bob Courtney, who is now deceased. Mm -hmm. He was in K Company, tied right into us. I did not know him at the time. Never, uh, didn't know anything about him until we were out of the service and probably had been home three years. Yeah. Were most of these casualties from machine gun fire? Well, uh, yes, and mortar fire. Uh, they had what you called a knee mortar, which was a small mortar and very portable. And uh, they called it a knee mortar because it was built actually to fit around your knee, the base of it. And uh, some of our guys tried firing those, some of we captured, and broke a leg. <laughs> so the, the, the knee mortar came, I think, only because uh, that, was, that was supposed to fit around, the, uh, it could fit around the leg, but they didn't use it that way, and you couldn't, uh, it'd break your leg when you fired them. Is that right? <clears throat> I've also heard, uh, Gene, that uh, something about a tank. Japanese have tanks there? Yes. Did you encounter one of those? Yes. Tell us about that. Well, they, they made a charge across the airport. And uh, as they were coming across the airport, we were at the edge of the airport that set up our perimeter defense. And uh, these were their small tanks, not their big ones. They had two different kinds. They had a small three-man tank and they had a large tank, like uh, the Americans and Germans had. And this was a small tank coming across the airport. And when it reached our side, uh, I ran out with uh, my BAR and stuck that BAR through the track of the tank and stopped it so that it couldn't continue and do any more damage. And as when the tank stopped, I guess the tank commander or whoever it was in the tank didn't know uh, what had stopped him. He didn't know what had caused the tank to stop. So he raised his top and canopy and uh, looked out. And uh, suddenly there was nothing there that was looking. And uh, Bob Courtney that I mentioned, uh, he was on the other side of the tank. And as I said, I didn't even know him at the time. And he didn't know me. And he had grabbed a shotgun from one of the officers, and uh, the officers carried shotguns. They were the only ones that did. And he had grabbed a shotgun and uh, had shot the Japanese. And I knew that this happened, and uh, but I didn't know who had done it. And he didn't know who had stopped the tank. And this until about three years after the war was over, and one of the fellows at Donnelly's that we were working, that I was working with in my department. Uh, mentioned that he had heard a war story that uh, was just absolutely amazing to him and he told me what it was and I said I want to meet the man that told you this story uh, because I'm the guy that stopped the tank and I did not know that he was the guy it's a small world so we got together and uh, and discussed it exactly what happened and I knew he was not lying because I was there and he described it in detail just like I could. Uh, how did you, you said you stuck your BAR in there which mm -hmm. wouldn't allow the tread to go, allow you to go. Did you, uh, were you commanded to do this or was this no. something you thought you'd... No, I just did it to stop that tank because uh, the machine guns on that tank and their, their small cannon were just tearing hell out of us. How did you get up to that? I just went across the ground low underneath the machine gun fire and stuck the rifle through it. The BAR. Yeah. Then the BAR had... is pretty... Uh, back then, to me, uh, the BAR was the best weapon we had for uh, the foot soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, machine guns, you had to have a particular position and everything to and an advantage point for a machine gun to operate and, and be successful and do the job. But a BAR, although it was heavier than the M1, 
uh, it held, their magazines on the BAR held 15 rounds of ammunition, and uh, they were cumbersome, they were heavy to carry, but you could fire them one at a time, or blast the three, or put out the whole 15. Mm -hmm. They had a tremendous amount of firepower. Now, is this after you were wounded and swam ashore? Yes. Yeah. In other words, okay. Then, um, and by the way, uh, I never had any results, uh, bad results from that wound in the leg. Uh, and uh, the corpsman in our outfit knew what I had done. And they uh, rebandaged the leg several times for me. And they said probably the salt water uh, did more good mm -hmm. than anything that they could have done in uh, making that wound heal and cleansing it. The fact that I swam back through the salt water uh, was was really to my advantage. Yeah. Well, we've got the Japanese tank stopped and done away with the tank commander. Take us from there, Gene, on the battle on Peleliu. Well, uh, we were set up in phase lines. If if you. Uh, or in the infantry, you know that the the battle plan is you go by phase lines. Phase line one, two, three, four, five, whatever it takes to go the distance that you need to go. And the reason for those phase lines is is for when you reach that particular point, that's your stopping point. Like phase line one, that's mm -hmm. your stopping point to regroup mm -hmm. and find out then are we going to be able to go to phase line two with what we've got, do we need more support, whatever it takes to do it. But you can't just continue to go or you get completely separated and uh, as a battlefield is nothing but chaos. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason for the phase lines. And uh, uh, to say go ahead from there, it's, it was just a, a continuous battle until we secured the island just one phase line after another. Until How long did it take to secure the armor? It took about uh, 48 days, really. They had told us we'd do it in 48 hours and 48 days before the island was termed secure. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I came off the line, as did my, uh, the, the people left in my company, uh, about three days prior to that. The army came in, an army division came in to relieve us Mm -hmm. because we were, uh, by that time, there just wasn't enough of us to hold what we had taken. Mm -hmm. And the Army came in to relieve us, and we were relieved from the line and uh, went back to the beach to board ship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose we camped on the beach probably for three days also until mm -hmm. they could make arrangements to get us on board ship to leave mm -hmm. the island. Then where would you go, Gene? We went back to Pavuvu Island from there and uh, got replacements in, which uh, there were very few of us left, and we got replacements in, went into retraining, and we uh, even went back to Guadalcanal to do some training there, from Babugu Island. And uh, then we went on the uh, campaign to Okinawa. Okay. Uh, how did you get to Okinawa? Troop ships, the same way that we did, and we made landings the same way with the LSDs, uh, but we did not hit the resistance that we did on Peleliu Island. The two, the two islands I think uh, noted in, in history will be that were the hardest uh, on the landing troops, the hardest islands to get on land were probably uh, Tarawa and Peleliu. And both of them, uh, we lost many, many men. Uh, in the water before we before we got on land, and those were probably the two two worst. Mm -hmm. Did you come anywhere near uh, getting to Iwo Jima? In that battle? No, uh, that was another division altogether. See, they had six Marine Corps divisions. Mm -hmm. When the war first started, we had two. And uh, then they kept increasing and increasing until they had uh, actually six divisions of Marines. And, uh, uh, well, for instance, the second division was on uh, Bougainville. Uh, first Marines were on 
uh, Guadalcanal, Cape Gloucester, Peleliu, and Okinawa. And then uh, the third, the fourth, and fifth, they had their own particular islands that they were in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you got to, to uh, Okinawa on a troop ship. Was your landing there similar to the landing? No, it, the landing at uh, Okinawa, we, we get very little resistance uh, going in on the LSTs and very little mortar fire. And uh, in fact, we were probably uh, we were probably uh, 10 miles in before we hit very much resistance at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think this is because the second division, they made a, a diversion tactic and the second division was on the opposite side of the island from us. And they, they actually loaded in LSTs and circled just like they were going to come in to land. So they had put all their support really in that direction the Japanese had. Mm -hmm. And then we came in back of them on the other side. Mm -hmm. Did you land at Buckner Bay? No, uh, it was not. I don't think it was called Buckner Bay. Uh, about all I can tell you exactly what the landing was, uh, we landed on Yellow Beach. They had blue, yellow, green, purple, and that was the different landing spots that the different outfits went in on. And uh, ours was yellow. Now did you wait a few days off the island before you went in? No. You, no, we, when, when everything got into place, uh, well you say a few days, I suppose maybe a, a couple of days before all troop ships arrived and were in proper position where they wanted them. What I'm, getting at, yeah, what I'm getting at here, Gene, is uh, what action you saw from kamikazes on our ships. Well, we didn't see we didn't see much at all in our landing, but uh, some some did. But in our particular uh, phase of the landing, we did not see it. But later, when we uh, when we started south, see, when we first when we hit Okinawa and secure the airport there, and that was a, a first objective, was to secure the airport there also. Then the 1st Marine Division turned north, and we secured the northern half of the island. And uh, the, the biggest resistance was in the southern end. That's where the Japanese had concentrated their forces, was more in the southern end. And uh, after we, after we secured the northern end of the island and cleared it off, then we came south. And, and uh, an army division, I think it was the 27th Army Division, uh, had hit an awful lot of resistance and um, claimed that they could not push forward anymore to their next phase line. So we came in and relieved them. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to push out the next day. Okay. Let's take a break at this time. Oh, okay. Cameraman. I was going to ask him. <coughs> uh, Gene, just as a little review here. Uh, now, in your Okinawa, uh, in the invasion of Okinawa, that would have been uh, in early 45, 1945? Yes. Uh, I, believe, I believe that we hit the island on Easter, Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. what, so that would have been somewhere in uh, last of March or first of April. Was there a reason for going in on Easter? Well, the reason was I'm, I'm sure that they felt that the Japanese would not be expecting us to hit since uh, Easter was a tradition, but uh, I'm sure our, our uh, powers to be felt that they could pull that surprise and uh, make the landing easier. And perhaps it did, uh, because we, hit, we did not get a lot of resistance uh, ground force resistance, at least uh, in our landings. Mm -hmm. So it may have been a, a big surprise to them. Yeah. Just to back up and get some time frames in here, uh, your invasion of uh, Peleliu would have been in 44? In 1944. Mm -hmm. Just about a, a year before that, maybe? Uh, I, 
I don't know exactly the month that we hit Peleliu. Uh, record will show, of course, but uh, I, I would hesitate to say. What uh, I have explained before that uh, the enlisted man uh, really was not worried about dates. Uh, officers uh, who had to write reports and had to keep records, mm -hmm. they were, uh, dates were vital to them. But to us, we didn't know whether it was Sunday, Saturday, it didn't make no difference. Right. And sometimes didn't even know, uh, pay attention to what month it was. Right. And uh, uh, now some enlisted men, you know, might have a, uh, in their mind, might have a record of these things, but they meant nothing yeah, to me. I, I, can, didn't, I, can I didn't care what the date was. I can understand that. Okay, now you're, you didn't really hit resistance until you were about 10 miles in, and then what did you run into, Gene? Well, we hit uh, uh, a lot of rifle fire and uh, machine gun fire, and uh, they were continuously. Uh, we hit very few planes at that particular time um, because uh, our Air Force was keeping them busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were bringing in kamikazes, and, and some of the landing crafts did get hit by kamikazes. But uh, the particular one that I was in, in our phase of it, we didn't we didn't hit that until, like I say, about ten miles in, and then we hit the the foot troops. Foot troops were they in caves? No, not on Okinawa. Uh, although they did use their burial uh, caves in on Okinawa, they were of Japanese descent, and their burial tombs were built in the side of hills. Uh, there'd be a valley, and then they built burial tombs on both sides. Mm -hmm. And what these things, what they do, they have a, uh, it, it's, it's just a basket, really, that they put the bodies in, and then they have shelves built in there that they, once that body has decayed, they, they seal the cave, and, and once it has decayed, then they go in and take the bones and put them in and the remains and put them in urns mm -hmm. and there would be like a, a maybe I don't know for sure but I assume that it's each family had their own burial cave and everybody that died in that family for years and years back yeah. were in those urns along the cave inside the cave and then the Japanese used those they tunneled from one of those caves to another till they could go clear down that valley uh, through those caves without showing themselves mm -hmm. through okay. the barrier caves. Okay, what, well, as you were um, 10 miles in running into resistance uh, from the foot troops of the Japanese, uh, tell us more now what, uh, and what led up to uh, uh, the events that we've heard about in the last uh, week or so. Well, We, when we were in the, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we cut the island in two. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the 1st Marine Division swept north and uh, cleared out the northern uh, portion of the island. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, it wasn't a halfway mark, but where we cut the island in two was the narrowest point. And then we went north and we were cleaning out the villages. and. Uh, uh, getting rid of the Japanese troops uh, wherever we found them in pockets. And uh, the particular thing, that event that, that uh, they felt I was deserving of the Silver Star for, uh, we went into a village and then we were told we had orders to leave that village. And they were going to bypass it because we were hitting such heavy resistance. And they felt that what we could do was bypass that village and uh, uh, really just starve them out. They wouldn't get any supplies, they wouldn't get anything. And when whatever they had there, that was going to be it. So the firefight would have not been necessary. When we got the orders to come out and we hit uh, uh, our reconnaissance spot uh, for regrouping, uh, they we found that three guys were missing. We really didn't from your from from our uh, 
Well, my company. Your company. Yeah, it was not from my platoon, but from my company. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and we didn't really know whether they had got killed, whether they were still in there alive, but some of the uh, the fellows felt that they were still in there alive and were pinned down, the last they had seen of them. So, uh, it ran through my mind, if that were me in there, I sure wouldn't want the outfit to pull out and leave me pinned down in there to either be killed or captured. So it, it was no hesitation on my part, uh, thinking that, I said, I'm going in after him. <coughs> and Lieutenant Matthews had his orders to pull out. He gave me permission to go. And uh, I made my way in to where I, I was pretty sure that that was the last that I had seen. What were you armed with? I took with me, I, I gathered up six grenades, six hand grenades, and six BAR clips. And uh, that's what I went in with. And uh, I used all six grenades and was down to my last BAR clip when I came out. And I looked Were there at, a lot of Japanese in there? Oh, yes. There were two machine gun nests. And then uh, above, up on a hill, that's the one that was firing at me as I came out. And our guys were trying to keep them down uh, by giving me covering fire. But uh, they were in no position uh, really to stop them. And they were just firing at me as I came down that ditch. In other words, it was you against all these Japanese. Yes, that's what I meant. And you used all your grenades? I used all my grenades, took out two uh, uh, machine gun nests which were in there and they were located not too far apart for protection for each other where they could cross fire and uh, give, give each other protection so uh, what were they behind what uh, a village was it uh, made of uh, what kind of material were they in cover under what did you have well, to go through they, they were in they were in a uh, street uh, set up at the edge of the street and as I say they were positioned they had built out of sandbags okay and uh, uh, to where they just had a, a regular little nest in there to fire their machine guns from and there were four each in each of the machine guns nests uh, that I didn't determine quickly <laughs> that there were four in were each you Yes, there were four in each one of them, and uh, with the grenades I got rid of them, and uh, then I met some rifle fire also that was protecting the machine gun nests, and uh, that's when I started with the BAR. That's all I had left. No, yeah, well, there were eight. Um, that's at least eight Japanese plus the ones that were right, had rifles. I guess. Yeah. Well, there, were, there were there were there were a lot of Japanese in that village. I mean, there was I I, I would assume probably a whole company of them. And uh, how many did you eliminate? Do you think? Approximately. I twelve, fifteen. Yeah, I would say probably that many. But uh, who counts? I don't. I don't well, know that wasn't the important thing. No, no. The important but, thing uh, was to get those boys out there. Yeah. That's I did what I did. Yeah. What did I you had find to do them? To get them. Did you see them? Oh yes. Yeah, I found them. After I eliminated the machine gun uh, nests that were uh, pinning them down, where they they couldn't move. Uh, as soon as I got rid of the machine gun nest, then I was able to get to them and did direct you talk them, to them out. Oh well, yeah, I I told them how to get out of there and directed them out, and then I used diversionary tactic because uh, they were. They knew I was there, the Japanese did, and they were after me. And uh, uh, after I got the other guys directed how to get out of there, past the machine guns that I had, that I had eliminated, then I used a diversionary tactic going down the dry creek wash, let them fire me so they wouldn't be fired at the other guys because they were out of ammunition. They had nothing to protect themselves. They were just, they were there. They couldn't get out. Did you have your BAR when you were running? Oh God, yes. 
I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have got rid of that. No. <laughs> oh, but those are heavy, aren't they? Well, they're heavy, yes, but uh, like I said, I was down to my last clip. But uh, if I if I did get hit uh, and and fell, maybe I could have got to cover where I could still protect myself with that one clip mm -hmm. until help got to me. Because uh, my uh, the boys in my platoon, they could see me, see uh, what I was doing. That would have been Lieutenant Matthews and, and yeah, Harry Pregerson and, and Earl, Earl Gregu. Gregu. Yeah, they could see it. Yeah. Now, now Earl Gregu, uh, when he saw it, he thought those bullets were getting off close to you when you were running. Well, according to the, of course, I wasn't looking behind me, but uh, according to the the guys, uh, uh, Earl and and uh, Pregerson and the others that saw it, uh, uh, they said it was just kicking up rocks right at my heels. And I was running with everything I had. And uh, fortunately, the guy may not have been a good shot. That's the reason I'm still here. They were firing at you with machine guns? Yes. And uh, the machine gun that, that was firing at me, uh, the guys in my outfit located knew where it was. It was higher up on a hill, uh, a knoll, and, uh, and they, uh, they were, like I said, trying to pin them down to keep them from firing that machine gun, but it wasn't doing any good. They, they were still getting hit. What, uh, you ran 150 yards, did you dive under cover then, uh, Gene, or what? Did no, you when, uh, at the end of the 150 yards, uh, that was back to my outfit. Oh, you were back to your yeah. outfit. Yeah, I got back in with the uh, with my platoon and my well, guys. With Lieutenant Matthews. Uh huh. Yeah. And then, then, uh, then and he happened. could have. Uh, I know Lieutenant Matthews could have kissed me uh, right there, <laughs> right there for having been able to do what I did because his orders were to leave and uh, and he was he didn't want to pull out. But orders are orders. Had those orders originally come from Colonel Bennett? Well, they came from battalion mm -hmm. down through Bennett. Bennett was the company commander, and uh, they came from battalion down to to Bennett, and from there to Lieutenant Matthews to pull out. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in hearing uh, those of you talk about this, now uh, you said Lieutenant Matthews was really happy for you when you got back. Uh, then. Did he get wounded soon after that, that, that kind of delayed all of this? Uh, yes, he, he told me at the, at the time when I came back, he, um, and like I said, I, he could have kissed me, I know. Uh, he was that glad that, that I had done what I did, and uh, because his orders were to pull out of there, and I just kind of took uh, that away from him. Uh, if a different officer may have said, if you go in, you're getting court-martialed. Mm -hmm. You're disobeying my orders. He didn't tell me that. So when I brought the guys out, and we all got back together again, and then, by the way, I didn't even know those three men. They were in my company, but I didn't know them. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't tell you their names today. It made no difference. Are they living, do you know? We don't know that. We, we don't think so. We think we're the only five guys left out of 247 men who were in our company. In other words, they, they possibly got killed later. Could have got killed later, yes. Mm -hmm. Or over the years they, they could have died. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when the war is over and you scatter back to your hometowns, right. uh, good heavens, in, in the service you, you know a lot of people, uh, maybe by only one name in all the time. You, you may have been with them for two years, mm -hmm. but you only know them uh, by one name, and it may be their last name, it may be their first name, it may be a nickname. Right. And uh, you you may have heard uh, where they were from, because that's one of the first things you state, you ask uh, when new guys come in, where are you from? And they'll say uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, Ohio. Uh, you don't necessarily remember that. and. Uh, that's that's what makes it so hard to locate mm -hmm. anyone once they get scattered that way after several years. You don't remember. You may remember what state they are, but what town? Yeah. How do you go about looking for them? Yeah, I and Harry Pregerson uh, dogged this thing after he found Lieutenant Matthews. Uh, 
then he started looking for me and Earl Dragoo, and he found Earl first. But the only way they found me was Earl Dragoo remembered that I was from Indiana, mm -hmm. and that the name of the town he thought I was from had a vill on the end. My he didn't know. Look how many towns in, mm. in Indiana have the word Ville as the last. And so they begin to search. And Harry got a hold of a man in uh, the Marine Historical Society in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And through that, they started searching for the towns and the people. He knew my last name, didn't know my first name. And they began to, to search and uh, through the Douglases, and then find somebody, a uh, Douglas, that had a bill after his address, and they uh, they finally narrowed it down to Crawfordville. Isn't that something? So well, it took, did it your took over two years for him to locate who did your first? Who called you first then? Harry Craigerson. Were you surprised? Oh, it was like a, it was like a, <laughs> a voice out of the past, you know. I just imagine. My God, after all those years, and I, I, I truthfully thought all these guys were dead. I had heard, uh, well, really before I went overseas, about what had happened to the rest of the, of the uh, L Company men, and uh, we thought they were, we thought they were wiped out. They're still gone. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Uh, were you uh, uh, near Lieutenant uh, Matthews when he got wounded? No, I was gone. Uh, I had got wounded and was uh, shipped out to Guam, taken by uh, aircraft to Guam to the hospital, 113. Did you get hit with a bullet yes. fire again? Yes, and I uh, got hit with a dum-dum bullet through the shoulder, tore my arm and shoulder. How many days would that have been after uh, you rescued these three men? Probably, uh, oh, well, we had cleaned out the northern part and had come south again, so it probably was a month. I see. Maybe but that kind of split you up from Harry Craigerson and uh, Lieutenant Matthews, and yeah, uh, I got I got wounded and uh, and shipped out of there to uh, Guam to the hospital, and then uh, according to what what we have learned by talking to each other, uh, Matthews got uh, wounded about two weeks after I did, uh, and he was very very seriously wounded. Yes. He spent. 13 months in the hospital uh, doing reconstructive surgery because he had lost the uh, whole side of his mm -hmm. skull and face. I wonder what, uh, what he got hit with. I think, uh, I'm, not, I'm not positive about this, but I believe it was shell fire. I think he got a piece of... Uh, he's lucky to be alive. Oh, I mean, he certainly I is. I got to know him pretty well and he's... Uh, he has he has made a tremendous uh, comeback. I I think from the serious wounds that he had. My gosh, he he was just just all but dead. Okay. <clears throat> well, you're back on Guam uh, after being wounded. Uh, then then take us from there, Gene. Well, from from uh, my hospital stay in Guam, uh, it was nearing the end of the war because uh, Okinawa was our last island that we had to hit and take. Uh, then the bomb dropped on Hiroshima and uh, that of course set the stages for the war's end and uh, I was in what they call a transit center after I got out of the hospital uh, waiting to be shipped home to the United States and uh, when the bomb was dropped that's where I was mm -hmm. and uh, that put a finish to the war and then uh, when I came home, uh, I had to. I came home in December, back to the states in December, and they sent me to uh, Quantico, Virginia, to the hospital there for a, uh, about a two-month stay. I got a concussion, and uh, which which does not show really as a wound in my records. But it, it was probably as serious as uh, any of the wounds I got. But uh, when, I got, when I got the concussion, it, it didn't bother me. Uh, well, I was out for three days, and I was in a field hospital. A burial detail had picked me up, thinking I was dead because the outfit was on the move when I got uh, blown out of a shell hole, or out of a foxhole. And uh, 
uh, they put me in the burial detail picking up the, the dead, uh, picked me up and found that I was still alive. Mm -hmm. So they took me back to a field hospital and uh, uh, I was there three days. Uh, so they tell me when I came to and I was sitting on the edge of a bunk, just exactly like I was ready to take off because we were going down a railroad track to clear both sides of a valley. And uh, then when I came to, I mean physically I felt everything was fine. Mm -hmm. I wasn't hurt. Mm -hmm. So they released me and sent me back to my outfit. And uh, then uh, after I got uh, the leg wound or the shoulder wound <coughs> and was sent to Guam, then I began to have uh, uh, <coughs> I begin to have blackout spells. I see. And it was caused from that concussion and a pressure someplace, and that's the reason they held me and didn't discharge me when I first came home and sent me to Quantico, Virginia, to the hospital. Uh -huh. And uh, it's kind of it's kind of funny what the what <coughs> the doctors finally came up with. I carried around a, from one doctor to another, and I must have seen forty doctors that all put me through the examinations and uh, x-rays and I must have had a sheaf of x-rays uh, um, inch thick that I carried from one doctor to another and they'd look at them and then take more. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't find the pressure that was causing my problem. So they told me uh, their final diagnosis was that there was a pressure causing the blackouts and, when, and I had tremendous headaches. Oh my! Uh, unbelievable and they told me that I would have one of the blackout spells and would not come out of it hmm. and then they would be able to find hmm. that pressure or they would gradually diminish but over about a three-year period they gradually diminished until that's great cleared. That's and, great. and since about that third year well when I first came back and went back to work at Donnelly's uh, I don't expect I worked uh, probably the first year, any two straight weeks without a day off. I, so I, I, I blacked out at Donnelly's and they'd have to take me home or I might mm -hmm. uh, not even be able to make it into work. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah. But they did, and I noticed this, that they did get gradually farther and farther apart. And uh, like I said, yeah, about good. the end of three years and they were gone. No problems with that now? None whatsoever. That's great. Um, okay, you've been... Um, uh, approximately what date did you uh, get your separation papers then? I got my separation papers in uh, the last of February in 46. Okay. I, I came home in December of 45 and, uh, and then stayed the two months in the hospital and was, uh, was given my full discharge in, uh, I think it was February. Last of February. And then you uh, went back to Donnelly's to work as, yes. you, as you said. Went back to Donnelly's. I see. And you were with them until you retired at when? 41, 41 years later I retired. Well, uh, actually I'd been in there two years before I went to the service, but uh, they give you continuous uh, seniority, I mean, uh, just like you hadn't been away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked at Donnelly's 41 years and retired uh, 1980. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I took early retirement. Yeah. Uh, since then, uh, you've been uh, commander of the American Legion. Yes. In 1970, I was commander of the American Legion. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, chef of the 40 and 8, mm -hmm. and uh, went through chairs prior to both of those commands. Mm -hmm. uh, held several offices. Okay. Uh, family. Uh, you're married. I'm married. Uh, I have uh, two sons, and my wife had, uh, I married a, a lady who had been married before, and she has a boy and a girl, and uh, my oldest son is, uh, he was born in 49, and my youngest son was born in 52, mm -hmm. and they both have uh, families of their own. How many grandchildren do you have? I have... Uh, Nine, ten, eleven grandchildren between uh, my own boys and uh, 
and uh, my wife's two children. What do you do now, Gene, for hobbies? Well, uh, just about anything I want to. <laughs> That's really Claire, just I about know, anything I, I, I want I know to. you like to play golf in I, Florida. I do love to play golf, and I, I play uh, really more golf up here than I do in Florida. It's harder to get on a golf course in Florida. You have to have uh, reservations three days in advance, so it's, it's kind of hard to get uh, every day. But here, uh, I can go out to municipal and play golf about any day I want yeah. to. I do. I never play on weekends because uh, I can remember when I was working, and that's the only time I had to play golf. And you'd go out there and stand around and wait, wait for a tee, get ready to tee off. And uh, since I retired and I can play any day I want to, I just avoid the holidays and the weekends and let the people, the working people. Uh, have the golf course. That's great. As as I'm concerned. That's great, Gene. Uh, <clears throat> we might back up just a little bit here uh, uh, and tell us uh, how many years you waited for the Silver Star, and uh, then tell us a little bit about what happened uh, on the 21st of March here in Crawfordsville this year. Well, uh, we got off the track a little bit when I when I uh, brought the three men out that I rescued, the lieutenant told me he was going to put me in for the Silver Star. And uh, that that really didn't mean too much to me at the time. I mean, uh, if he had, uh, fine, but if he didn't, that was, I never thought anything more about it. And then he got wounded shortly after that, in about two weeks, and uh, uh, never had a chance to write it up. Uh, it's kind of hard, I'm sure, in combat to sit down and uh, and we were in combat. Sure were. To sit down uh, and write up the forms necessary to get someone presented the Silver Star. And uh, the papers are there and they're available, but uh, uh, he just never did have an opportunity. I and I and I realize that I've, even after all these years. And as I said, at the time, that, that didn't mean anything to me. Uh, and then I, you know, I promptly dismissed it until Harry Pregerson uh, located all of us and we got together and we got to rehashing what had happened. And uh, Harry thought that I had been given the Silver Star. He thought Matthews had, had put me in for it. And uh, Tom explained that, well, no, he didn't. So Harry said, well, if there were notes and records made of it, of, of what you did, then you're still deserving of the Silver Star. So he said, let's hit the proper channels and connect the right people and see if we can get it. And he's worked on that, my heavens, doing it all by phone from California. I know. Calling into Washington, D.C. and getting the right people. It's, uh, it's, it's just miraculous that he was able to do that. And uh, without his knowledge and, and the things that he uh, learned and, and the many, many people that over the years he has, he has met, I, I doubt if he would have been successful in doing it. I would agree. It would be awfully hard for me uh, because he knows people in Washington, D.C. that I never heard of. Mm -hmm. still, many are still connected with uh, the military. Mm -hmm. Many of them are uh, working in offices, uh, even though they're retired. Uh, for instance, the colonel uh, that was there for the presentation works in Washington, D.C., and uh, Fred Anthony, and uh, he's retired from the military, but he still has a civilian job with the military. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, he's quite an amazing man. Yes. If you got to talk to him much. I did talk to him a little bit. He's, uh, he's, he's quite amazing. He said he got so sick and tired when he was in the service of the Corsairs coming over and disrupting everything that he decided, okay, I'm going into the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And he was not in the Air Force originally, mm -hmm. but he went in the Air Force and uh, became a pilot. Okay. So he's really had uh, kind of two military careers. And is now retired and uh, works as a civilian in the military in Washington. <coughs> well, 
Well, Gene, uh, it's been, uh, we really enjoyed uh, hearing your story. Uh, for those of you who are watching this interview, uh, it is our plan to have a recording uh, of the uh, delayed presentation of the Silver Star to Eugene Douglas that was made on March 21st, 1992, uh, here in Crawfordsville. We had uh, several of his comrades that were there on Okinawa with him when he uh, was such a courageous person in rescuing these three men. Uh, we plan to have that tape in the library too, along with this tape. And I just want to say, Gene, that uh, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to come in and give us this story, which you've done a fantastic job on. And on behalf of the Historical Society and the people of Montgomery County, I want to thank you for what you did for America. Thank you, thank you much. Very much. Thank you, Claire. the VIPs. To my left, the chaplain of the American Legion post, Mr. Browning. 
Stand next to him is the commander of the American Legion Post, Mr. Gary Bell. Representative from the VFW Post, 1431, Mr. Ed Gilt. Mayor of Crawfordsville, Mr. Philip Michael. Colonel Fred Anthony. Colonel, USMC retired. Colonel Fred Anthony. here today to honor a veteran of World War II who held his comrade's life more precious than his own. He went those extra steps. We pray for his happiness and well-being. Amen. I'd like to welcome everybody to Post 72 today to help us celebrate this occasion. Not every day we get to see something like this happen. Gene, in April 21st, 1945, you give America a very special day. Today, 
even though it's very late, America returns the favor. On behalf of Post 72 and all veterans, I would like to salute you. I'd like to thank the United States Marine Corps and the United States Army for participating in the program today. And I'd like to give special thanks to a certain group of people who helped make this become possible today. First, Jim Clark and his crew for doing the decorations. What a wonderful job they did with all American flags. Jim, where are you? <coughs> Reception immediately following the program today. Bart Dickey and the ladies auxiliary you seen on the table outside. This is also the 73rd birthday of the American Legion. And they furnished a cake out there to help celebrate today and celebrate the Legion's birthday. Judge Fragerson helped get this program started and uh, coordinated it with us. And special thanks to Claire Chamberlain. Claire? Yeah, Claire Court was our coordinator for this program, and between Judge Prager and himself, this all became possible today. As shown unwavering devotion to duty during the battle on the island of Okinawa on April 21st, 1945. And whereas, at great risk of his own life, Louis Eugene Douglas distinguished himself with bravery and daring. And whereas, Louis Eugene Douglas displayed courage initiative and a fighting spirit to save his comrades. And whereas all of us are proud and congratulate Lewis Eugene Douglas upon the presentation of the Silver Star Medal for Gallantry in Action. Now therefore, I, Philip Q. Michael, Mayor of the City of Crawfordville, do hereby proclaim Saturday, March 21st, 1992, as Lewis Eugene Douglas Day, and urge all citizens in Crawfordville to join in this celebration. In witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused a great seal in the city of Crawfordsville to be affixed at the seat of government this 18th day of March in the year of our Lord 1,992. Philip Q. Meyer, Michael, Mayor of Crawfordsville, it's my pleasure to present this to you, Lewis Eugene Douglas. Thank you. Life membership. This life membership is presented. You can buy a life membership, but you can also earn one. And we voted unanimously that Doug earn this silver star. And at this time, I'd like to present to Doug with the life membership. Commanders, chaplain, through the honor judge, colleagues, friends, family of Doug, and certainly friends of all for him and fellow legionnaires. First, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you. And I was to where were you? I had to buy mine. 